are important. You belong. You have a destiny and a future. World Impact Celebration Church Online is a spiritual family of believers from all over the world where you can discover your purpose and grow in the grace of Jesus Christ. You will hear teachings by Dr. Peter Youngren, Pastor Nathan Thurber, and others. You will participate in worship, prayer, and taking the Lord's communion every week. You will enjoy video testimonies and interviews from around the world. No matter where you live, your prayer request will be included in every service. This will truly be an international online church. Wherever you live, from Southeast Asia to Europe, North and South America, Africa, and Australia, this can be your spiritual home. All over the world, I meet people who ask me if there's a way that they can participate in the services from the Toronto Celebration Church. Well, we're offering something much more than just a streaming service. This is a full-fledged online church for you. The World Impact Celebration Church Online is a place where you can find a spiritual family, a place of belonging, and where you can grow in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Set your calendar for 10.30 a.m. New York time. That's 4.30 p.m. Central European time and 10.30 p.m. for most countries in Southeast Asia. Heaven will include people of every culture, nationality, and ethnicity, and this will be a foretaste of heaven. World Impact Celebration Church Online is a place where you belong, where you will be nurtured, and where you can find your destiny. of the Toronto Celebration Church is a story of God's love drawing people from different backgrounds, cultures, even religions to be empowered to live their maximum life and to serve the community and the world. When I came here, I couldn't walk. I couldn't stand. I had a walker. But when I came to TICC, I was totally and completely miraculously healed. TICC is a family for us, for me and my husband. Uh, one of the best things that I really like about TICC is definitely the youth ministry or the youth program. And I'm truly blessed here uh, by the simple message of God's unconditional love, grace and mercy. I found the church I've always dreamed of. A church is not about building. It is about people. People from every part of society, young and old people from Asia, Europe, the islands of the sea, Africa, and across the Americas, together creating a better society. Because to personally know God's love is the key to the ultimate life. And in a constant pursuit to find ways to communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ to Toronto and Canada, we believe that the best is yet to come. 
Welcome Celebration Church. We're so glad that you have joined with us today. I know that you are going to be blessed and receive something very special for you. We've got lots planned coming up. Pastor Peter will be joining us. We'll be taking Holy Communion, a special ministry report. So without further ado, why don't we worship together through music? Hello, Celebration Church. We welcome you to worship with us right where you are. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Come on and give the Lord praise. Come on, clap your hands. Christ. 
through him who loved us and gave his life to save us. Father, we thank you today that you are our rock. In you we live and move and have our very being. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. So in the middle of every storm, we take refuge in knowing that you got everything in your hands. You are worthy from the rising of the sun to the going down of the sun. You are worthy. You deserve every bit of worship, every bit of praise. We give it to you. You are with us wherever we go, and we bless you today. Hallelujah. song we could ever sing.
Amen. Well, it's great to have you with us today. And a little bit later, Pastor Peter will be with us to partake in the Holy Communion. So get your prayer request ready. And we believe that God is answering prayers this morning. We want to hear from you. And we're excited here in Toronto that as of this morning, actually last Friday, but as of this morning here at, in Church World, we are able to meet indoors again. And so if you live in the Toronto area, come on out next Sunday. Uh, it's going to be a powerful day together. But today's message is people of the Spirit. You can see it on the screen behind me. One of the main emphasis of the New Covenant is how God gave himself to us. It's one of the biggest emphasis of the new covenant, how God gave us himself. Jeremiah chapter 31 in verse 33, God says, prophetically speaking through Jeremiah, he said, I will be their God and they will be my people. But notice the promise, I will be their God. God gave us many blessings, of course, and we celebrate those, we preach those blessings, but the greatest blessing he gave us was himself. And it's a personal blessing. It's a wonderful blessing if you think about it. It's because it's, you know, even in the natural, I could give it, you know, people can give gifts for a variety of reasons. You can even give a gift without loving somebody. You can give an impersonal gift. It can be, you know, without any affection or, you know, there's various reasons. But when you give somebody yourself, God, of course, there are many blessings that come and we preach those, but God gave us himself. God gave us himself, main emphasis of, the, of this new covenant. And it highlights the big difference between a covenant and a contract. We preach that a lot, that the covenant that God made with us is much more than a contract. A contract exchanges things or possessions, but a covenant, it's an exchange of, of, a pers of your person, of the, who you are. A and God in this new covenant gave us himself through his son Jesus uh, and and now today we have him in the form of the Holy Spirit, one of uh, the nature of who he is. This is the blessing of the new covenant. The greatest blessing is himself. He brings all the blessings, healing and strength, sanctification and uh, righteousness, but it's found in him. And he gave us to this, and it's one of the main clauses of the covenant. In fact, the prophet Ezekiel, he was pro pro speaking prophetically, but he said in Ezekiel 36, verse 27, I will put my spirit in you. And so now today, as a believers in Christ, in this new covenant, the Holy Spirit lives in us. So you could say God lives in us. He gave us himself. And, and him in us works out all the blessings, works out sanctification, works out healing, works out a, a prosperity and blessing. But we don't seek after the blessings. We simply enjoy relationship with him. He brings it all. And as he, we enjoy relationship with him, he begins to work to, in us to will and to do his good pleasure. This is a wonderful reality of the new covenant. And so we can say, as new covenant believers, we are people of the Spirit. People of the Spirit. It's the title of today's message that I, I, I have behind me. And yet it's important to recognize that as people of the Spirit, we have an individual relationship. We, every one of us, has an individual relationship with God through the Holy Spirit. But it plays out in a collective setting. It plays out in a collective setting. We're going to explore what that means in the moments we have together, but I'll read it again. As people of the Spirit, we have an individual relationship. And most likely, if you're a believer in Christ Jesus, you have an intensely personal relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's a beautiful thing. That's a beautiful thing. I wouldn't want to lose my personal relationship and that connection, that intensely personal relationship that I have with him for, for anything in this world. It's a beautiful reality. But we also must recognize that it plays out in a collective setting. What do I mean by that? Well, there's certain words in the scriptures that highlight this dual relationship that we have uh, with God and with the Holy Spirit and with Christ Jesus. One of those words is temple temple. 
Uh, in the Old Testament, of course, if we take time, we won't take that much time today, but, but in the Old Testament, the temple was a big deal. For example, the prophet Ezekiel, we quoted him just a moment ago, but the prophet Ezekiel spent nine chapters. Of course, he didn't write them in chapters. I understand that, but we've separated them into chapters. Nine chapters illustrating or detailing the specifics of the temple. And there's other, other books of the Bible in the Old Testament as well. It was a big deal to God. It was a big deal to God's people at that time, the temple. Now, we're not Old Covenant believers. We're New, Testament, New Covenant believers. And in the New Covenant, the scripture says that the tem God's temple, it's, it's believers, believers in Christ. For example, Paul said, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he said, don't you know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? And so that, that, that refers to that individual relationship that every one of us has with Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit lives in you. You are a temple of God. That means his presence lives in you. You don't need a go-between. We preach this a lot. You, you're the temple of the, of the Holy Spirit. Uh, that speaks of that very individual, very personal uh, aspect, which is a beautiful reality. But then we also have that collective side, how that individual relationship plays out in a collective setting Paul talks about that. He says, 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 16, he said, for we, speaking as a group, we or collectively, we are the temple of the living God. In other words, we are individually temples. God dwells in us by his spirit, but then collectively we come together and that relationship or that temple becomes an even greater reality on this earth. In other words, our relationship with the Spirit, with Christ Jesus, but as people of the Spirit, it's both personal, but it's also collective, and it always plays out in that manner in the Scriptures. For example, Peter talks about this, this, this reality, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. He says, you also, as living stones, living stones, in other words, you, are, you, you have Christ Jesus in you, you're a living stone. You're being built up into a spiritual house. Another translation says temple. In other words, each of us, in our individual way, come together, and we're, we're collectively making this beautiful spiritual spiritual house or temple for a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. And so again, we see that beautiful reality, individual and collective. And individually, we're living stones, Christ living in us. And then we come together and we build this spiritual temple, this spiritual reality, a holy priesthood. And we offer spiritual sacrifices to God at, through Christ Jesus. And so we see this playing out. And of course, on one hand, the individual, you could say, you know, there's the individual, but without the collective, we miss out on the fullness of what's the spiritual reality that's going on. And so we recognize this. Take, you know, again, sometimes, you know, in our minds that we get, you know, we, and we preach a lot on that, the believer's authority and our completeness in Christ, and we, we, we absolutely are. So we say, what's the necessity of the collective? What, what, what's, that, what's that all about? Well, again, you think about in the natural, if you're building a house, you're building a brick house, you know, every brick individually is a complete brick. It's, you know, the brick has, has a certain strength. There's you know, it's a strong brick, and, and, it's, and it has value. You know, every brick has value. So there's, you could say in that sense, as a brick goes, it's lacking nothing. Uh, and it has some strength, too. If I throw it at you, it'll hurt you. But, but we understand as well that when we bring many bricks together, we build an edifice, a beautiful edifice that people will pay a lot of money for. And so in the same way, yeah, we're complete in Christ, lacking nothing. But then God calls us collectively to come together, all of us complete in Christ individuals, to come together in a collective, and we build a, spir a, 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 a beautiful spiritual temple that collectively we offer spiritual sacrifices to God. And in that reality or in that understanding, we come into the fullness of the blessing that God intended for us in this new covenant world and reality. So we are people of the Spirit. We have an individual relationship in a collective setting. Another word to describe this reality of people of the Spirit is body. And as a body, we are individually, we're bodies of Christ, but then together we make up the body of Christ. And again, in this, in the natural, there's illustrations that illustrate how there's the complete, you know, com individually complete, but then we come together to make what is meant to be. You know, if you think about your natural body, every cell of your natural and my natural body uh, has life in it. 
Every cell has DNA. Your DNA is throughout every cell of your body. And life is in every cell. You could say, well, that one cell doesn't have life. No, we don't say that. Of course, they all, every cell has life. Every cell has DNA. And yet, if we take an individual cell outside of, the bo- out of your body or my body, the cell, the cell, which had all your life and all your DNA, it ceases to be. It ceases to be that which it was. And in a way, it describes as believers, we are complete in Christ. We're the body of Christ. But we come together to make up that beautiful body of Christ on this earth. Jesus in his parables, Luke chapter 15, he talks about a lost lost individual, a lost sheep, a lost coin. And he talks about him as a good shepherd or as that that, that housewife or as the good father would would go out and, and bring in that lost item. But they would find that he would find that lost item, or she, there's the woman in the, the story of the ten coins, would bring that lost item back into the collective. That's what the gospel is. It's, it's, it's this pic- picture of individuals who are lost being gathered and brought into a gathering. And so, again, it's hard to sometimes comprehend. Now, I know in our church family here in Toronto, it's a very international family. So many, some of you didn't grow up in a Western setting. I did. You know, Western mindset is very individualistic. I don't need anybody else. I do it my way and, and, and I don't need anybody else. We're all islands unto ourselves. And in many ways, I think COVID-19 has precipitated this ment- mentally. For example, my son is four years old. He's in daycare. And there's a book that I re- I've read to him at, at night. I was reading it to him the other night. It's called we share everything. You know, I was trying to teach children to share. And he said to me, Dad, you know, uh, they tell me at school I can't share. Tell me, in fact, it's a rule now not to share. Now, I'm not criticizing the school. I understand, you know, during this pandemic, I guess they're not allowed to share things so that they don't spread germs. So they're now being taught not to share. My, I'm not trying to get into the idea, you know, ideology of parenting or, or daycares. I'm simply saying it's kind of, you know, we're, this, this idea that we're all islands unto ourselves has almost been, you know, uh, put in rocket boosters in, tw- in COVID-19 because we can't have, a, we have to be isolated from each other. We all, you know, it's essentially been made islands unto ourselves ourselves. And yet, uh, spiritually speaking, we must understand that we are called to a collective. Yes, we're complete in Christ. We have all the blessings in Christ. And yet the fullness of that which we're meant to experience is meant to be played out in the collective, the body of Christ. And and so we're grateful for TVs. And we have a Pastor Peter and this ministry and this church even at one point had a television program. We're all for (laughs) preaching the gospel on TV. But the Christian experience in the new covenant is not meant to be only a television Christian. That is not no New Testament example of that reality. We are called to a collective, to, to, uh, to experience the fullness of that which Christ Jesus purchased us for. We are people of the Spirit, individually, but called into a collective setting. You know the word church? The word church in Greek, it means ecclesia, which means an assembly. It means an assembly. And in the Greek setting, the assembly was speaking of a a governmental body that would come together to make rules. We do similar things today in our government setting. Uh, But it it meant a gathering, a gathering together. And from that perspective, when we understand what the scriptures mean by church, a gathering together in that local setting, and the predominant use of that word in the New Testament is for a local gathering of believers, we recognize that gathering together for... uh, church, if you will, it's not just a nice thing. It's not just a nice idea, maybe we do it, maybe. No, it's what church is. It's a collective gathering of all those individual cells of the body, a collective gathering of all the bricks, the living stones uh, of the temple. It's a collective gathering together, and it's what church is meant to be. It's what we are. And the New Testament pattern follows that throughout. For example, four examples, there's many more, but for sake of time, four examples. Number one, you see in the New Testament that the church regularly gathered together. They regularly gathered together. For example, 1 Corinthians 11, it says, when you come together as a church, when you come together. And so you can see regular gathering. Hebrews 10, we're exhorted, do not abandon your own meeting together meeting together. And so they regularly gathered together. Secondly, the church, we see in the New Testament, the church meeting is a distinct event. 
It was a distinct event in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 14, it says in verse 19, Nevertheless, in church, I prefer to speak five words with my, mouth, with my mind. Sorry. In other words, it was, a, it was an event. To speak those words at a, meant something was distinct was happening. Thirdly, a church's church in the New Testament, they met in specific places. Specific places. Acts 5.12, it says that the apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people, and with one accord the believers gathered together in Solomon's colonnade. So they knew where they were meeting, and they came to that specific place to meet together. And so we see these patterns. And number four, the church did specific activities. Specific activities. It wasn't some ambiguous thought or ambiguous, it'd be nice to do, no. Colossians chapter 3, they said they taught, they admonished one another with, with all wisdom. They sang psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And so we see specific activities taking place. 1 Timothy 4.13, where the, the Paul told Timothy as a pastor, devote yourself to public reading of scriptures, to exhortation and to teaching. And so we see specific activities taking place. Is what church does, is what a New Testament church does. They gather together for these purposes in a specific place, for specific activities activities, a distinct event. You see, what we learn from this is the church is a spiritual assembly. That's why I started today by talking, teaching on this new covenant, people of the spirit, the church, this gathering, it is a spiritual assembly of people of the spirit. And that understanding influences two things. It influences how we choose a church. It influences how we choose a church. When we understand that the church, a a gathering together of people of the Spirit, is a spiritual assembly, we understand that it's, it's not a club. Of course, we come together, we have many friendships, we've witnessed that so many times, how we come together as friends, but it's not simply, it's not a club. It's a spiritual assembly. It's not about entertainment. Although we have lights and cameras and we, we, you know, we live in a world where we try to relate in that manner. It's not about entertainment. It's a spiritual assembly. There's spiritual things that go on. It's not simply about life enhancement principles. And though, although that, that happens, but that's not what it's about. It's about spiritual life transfer. It's about new spiritual life for those who don't have it. And then it's about spiritual beings coming together for a spiritual purpose. It's not even, and, I, and I'm a parent, so this matters to me, but it's not even about simply providing a clean social environment for our children. That happens. You come to our youth on Friday night, that will happen, I promise you, or to our kids' world on a Sunday. But that's not the point. The point is spiritual lives coming together, a spiritual reality. We are a spiritual assembly. And so it influences how we choose a church. I put it this way and it's on screen. We are joined by the Holy Spirit to a supernatural collective of people in covenant community. It's who we are. We're spiritual beings. And so it, when, when understanding why we gather together, it, it influences how we choose. But it also influences how we relate to each other. That's how we relate. This is a big deal. Because uh, sadly, some people, they say, I'm not going to gather together with other spiritual beings, other believers in a local church setting because you know, there's too many hypocrites. Well, of course there's hypocrites. The church is not meant to be perfect people coming together. It's meant to be people of all spiritual maturity levels, all different stages of growth coming together. What kind of place would it be if there was no one who needed to grow and mature? Who you could mentor and who you could bring along? Of course not. And so to have this idea that, oh, it must be perfect people, I don't think we'd even want to be a part of such an assembly. No, the New Testament pattern was imperfect people coming together. But, it, but as when we understand we're a spiritual assembly, we relate differently to each other. Paul the Apostle is our perfect example. He was relating to a church in Corinth who, you know, probably really a messed up church. People were living very immorally in that church. They, had, they weren't following his teachings very well. You know, but he, he, he operated with what I call spirit-directed imag- a spirit-directed imagination because he, he understand this is a spiritual assembly. He understood what was going on. And for example, so here he is in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm going to read a couple of scriptures, uh, verses, where he's relating to this church. Remember, this church is living a lot of immorality going on in this church. So you think he's going to come with a big correction. And he admonished them and he corrected them. But notice how he related to them here. Uh, go, to, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 
verse 2. He's now he's writing to this, you know, rather messed up church. He says, to the church of God, which is in Corinth, to those who have been sanctified. I mean, if it's me or you, we'd be looking at this immoral church and saying, they've not been sanctified. But remember, he's looking at them in Christ. He's relating to them as spiritual beings in Christ Jesus. Verse 3 says, grace to you and peace. I mean, if it was me, I might have given, you know, been tempted to give, it, to give it to them. You know, a few straight words. No, he's giving them grace and peace. And then number four, he says, I thank my God always concerning you. He's thanking God for these troublesome believers in his life. I tell you, he's teaching us how to relate to others who are giving us problems, who are, you know, troublesome to immature believers. He's, teaching, he's saying, I thank my God for you. Whew, he's giving us a beautiful example. Then he says that in everything you are enriched in him. I mean, if you and I were looking at these immature believers who are running around doing crazy things, we may not be, not, may not be giving thanks and may not be thinking they're too enriched. And then he says in verse 6, just as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed to you, he's speaking new creation realities because he understands they're a spiritual assembly. He's speaking life to them. But this teaches us how to relate to others. And so, you know, too many believers, I find, I say, I'm not going to a gathering because there's imperfect people. Somebody did me wrong. Somebody didn't look at me right. Somebody was mean to me. Somebody you know, lied to me. Well, of course, there are, we, we, we are a spiritual assembly of imperfect people on different stages of our maturity level, but we understand we come together in Christ for a spiritual reason, a spiritual reason. We are a temple. We are a body. We have an individual relationship that plays out in a collective setting. This is the New Covenant, New Testament example that we follow. Why is it so important that we assemble? Why is it so important that we gather together? And by the way, this revelation and reality is being tested in the world and time we live in today. And I'll get to that in a moment. But I, I, think, I don't even have to spell it out. I'm sure you understand what I'm talking about. This revelation is being tested like never before. Uh, I shouldn't say never before. I'm talking in my lifetime of my 40 plus years. But in any case, you understand what I'm saying. It's being tested. But why is it important we assemble together? And there's many reasons. I'll give you two that I thought of today. Number one, it makes us visible to ourselves. You know, when you have a family reunion, what's a common thing that, I, and I'd be probably said I haven't had a family reunion in about two years, and you're probably right, nor have I. My family hasn't even been able to visit me from other parts of Canada. But we won't get into that. But when you have a family reunion, you take a photograph so that you can remember each other. It's a, it's, it's a powerful thing, and I think we do it because it's important. Now, in the same way, when we come together on a Sunday morning, and I was so excited that today, this Sunday, we're meeting in person again, but you and I are meeting virtually right now, but if you're in Toronto, I exhort you, come on out and assemble with us next Sunday. But what, 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 on a Sunday morning, it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful family photograph, family portrait that goes on. You have young, you have old. You have rich and you have poor. You have people of different political backgrounds, some who have just been through a celebration of life, some who are in tough times of life. You have other people who have children, some who don't, don't have children. You have people from different parts of the world, different mindsets, and yet we all come together with one big family photograph and we remind ourselves each other of who we are. That's important, so very vitally important. But then this next point I love, we make ourselves visible to the universe. You could say visible to the world around us, visible to the world we live in. We make ourselves visible. Ephesians chapter 3 and 10, the scripture says the multifaceted wisdom of God is displayed through the church to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. Of course, yes, as individual believers. I highlighted that at the beginning of my message today, and we preach on it endlessly, the believer's authority. But as individuals in Christ, believers in Christ, we are complete and lacking nothing. We have the Spirit of God living us. We're temples. But that individual relationship must play out in a collective setting. You see, for example, take the Supreme Court of Canada. There are nine Supreme Court justices. You know, and each of them, in their own, in their own essence, they are... They're Supreme Court justices. Now, if you lived in Ottawa, where the Supreme Court uh, resides in, in Canada, you could bump into one of them at the grocery store or at the gas station. You might have maybe your children play, uh, are playing uh, soccer to get their, your children, so you meet them. And you're, you're, you're interacting in that setting with the Supreme Court justice. And yet, we're in that setting on the soccer field or at the, at the gas station isn't necessarily where they're enacting rules that bind the nation of Canada uh, in that courtroom setting. No, that happens when they come together in the assembly, together as the Supreme Court. 
And so you could say, again, but now, now recognize they, their essence and being as a Supreme Court justice never, is never any less at the ESO station than it is on the bench when they're together with the other eight justices. But, but the rules and the power that they enact comes to fruition as they sit at the bench with the other eight Supreme Court justices. In the same, it's a weak illustration, but in, this, in, a, in some light, it brings a, a beautiful picture of what happens when we come together, individual uh, uh, believers in Christ with full authority, but when we come together in the body or in the temple or in that assembly as church, there's something dynamic and powerful that happens. Again, it doesn't take away from the individual aspect, but it, there's something beautiful as well. The fullness is realized when we come together collectively and we see that visible manifestation of God, the reality uh, of the temple, of the church, of the body of Christ on earth today. And so we can never forget the essence of the collective nature that church or the body of Christ was meant to be. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered, there I am. Of course, he's with the one, but he still emphasized the two or the three. When we come together, there he is. And where he is, there is fullness of joy. Oh, it's beautiful. And in the joy of the Lord, there is strength. I mean, amazing things happen when we come together. We are people of the Spirit. Individually, we are people of the Spirit. We have individual relationships, intensely personal and beautiful relationships, but they play out, they're meant to play out in a collective setting. It's a beautiful reality. You see, COVID-19 has forced every single one of us to ask this question of ourselves, what's the point of assembly? You see, we took the time when, when we were asked to by governmental leaders to meet virtually, we did it. A and we trusted that there was grace there for it. And I believe there was. Many people have reported, many of you have reported receiving great miracles, blessings. And I believe there was a grace there. But we can never forget the importance of assembly. And now that, now that we're reopening, and most likely there won't be more lockdowns. Now that, you know, I'm not getting into all of that. So now we must each ask ourselves the question, what's the point? You see, we can't look to governmental leaders to tell us what's the point of assembling together. I highlighted earlier that the church is a spiritual assembly. Now, we thank God there are believers who are in government, but not all governmental leaders are believers. And so if, you're, if, if an individual, the scripture says, when we're not believers in Christ, yet our, our, our understanding is darkened. And so to look to a person who has no understanding of a spiritual assembly to teach us whether what's the importance of assembling together, we're not going to find it. So we must go back to the scriptures, understand that they teach us the, what is the importance of assembling or gathering together and what's, what's the reality, what's going on. And so while we took time off, we must recognize, in a sense, when asked to, we must recognize that now is the time we've got to prioritize and get back to the essence or the discipline of assembling together because there is a purpose that is not going to be negated. It's been around since the New Testament and it's continuing today. And so it requires a fresh uh, discipline, a fresh focus and decision on every one of our parts that I want to be a part of the fullness of what God is doing in this world today. And it's going to be through the collective individually, un we're complete, but it plays out in the collective setting. You could say the church is almost, it could be like a marriage. And, and if you think of a marriage, you know, husband and wife are not always together. And maybe some of you say, hallelujah, thank God we're not always together. But, you, but, but in all seriousness, uh, you know, for example, maybe you're military, you're, you're, well, husband or wife, one of you is in the military. You know, you might go on an extended journey to another part. You might spend a year in another part of the world doing a peacekeeping mission or doing, you know, fighting a war. And, 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 and while that's not ideal, you know, you make the best of it in that setting. You make the best of it. But, and you might talk over Zoom, send pictures, you might, you'll talk on the phone. And, and that marriage can survive, but that's got to stop at some point. At some point, husband and wife have to come back together. If that continues forever, the marriage will fall apart. In other words, there's a season of grace for that separation, but it cannot last forever. And in the same way as believers who are called to a collective, remember Jesus' parables I talked about earlier, how, how there were pictures of bringing the lost back into the collective. We as believers in Christ, we were once lost, but now we're brought back into the collective. And so we must recognize that, yes, there was a time apart, but now is the time to come together again. It can't last forever. It's not healthy and it's not 
healthy that as a church, we continue forever to meet virtually. We thank God for the virtual setting. But now is the time to come together again in person. And so we recognize this beautiful promise and reality, the fullness of the blessing. Of course, we never negate the completion, the, the believer's authority and the completion we have in Christ, but recognize it's called to a co this collective setting. The God, Bible, the scriptures call, uh, exhort us to be planted in the house of the Lord. That means assembling together, taking that time to come together, you know, and it's important to recognize some, you know, it's, it's possible, and I'm just wrapping this up, but, you know, it's possible to say, you know, I did okay over the last year meeting online. You know, I, I felt kind of spiritually engaged. I felt... And that is possible. And I, I've talked to many of you who, who would think that. Let us, but let us not forget this reality. You know, many, many people who I'm talking to today, you had that discipline built in. You, you were assembling together. And, and you had that, that built in. And, and so there was a, a type of momentum, a spiritual momentum. You know, I heard Dr. Young Cho talk about that. There's a momentum. In the natural, you know what momentum is? It can carry you so far spiritually the same way. But in the same way, over time, that momentum starts to wane. So let's not mistake the grace that was there while we were able to be apart virtually. But there was a mo spiritual momentum there as well. But now is the time to come back together to reform disciplines. And I believe that actually this can be a blessing for us as we begin to think of this reality in fresh new terms. There can be an awakening in each of our hearts that maybe something that we took for granted before awakens in a whole new reality. And so this, to me, this is not a message of desperation and just pleading. No, we have a wonderful church who I've, we've sent such support from. And so I think this is a time for each of us to have an awakening to this reality of the purpose that we have been called together. And I think our greatest days are ahead of us, not limping forward, but charging forward as a collective, this local assembly, Toronto Celebration Church, charging forward into the years ahead, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, but recognizing the reality of the spiritual assembly that we've been called to be a part of, and I believe that our greatest days, we even in the missions where we've started this 20%, uh, doubling our missions this year, we believe that our greatest days are still out in front of us, that we're charging forward. And so in many ways, this message today is not, I am so pleased with our church. I love our church family, and I, I believe I'm preaching to the choir that, today. And so let's believe together, and whatever happens corporately, we understand individually blesses our lives as well. Just before I pass it to Pastor Peter, maybe you say today I'm watching and I don't have that spiritual life you're talking about. That spiritual life is available in Christ Jesus. He gives new spiritual lives. Maybe it feels dead inside. Maybe it's condemnation or guilt. Christ Jesus, he's forgiven you of all the wrongs and sins that you've done. He says, if you believe on me and confess Jesus as Lord, he'll become, he'll give you new spiritual life. Let this be that day when you receive this. Would you pray with me? You say, Nathan, I want to receive that. Say, dear Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for forgiving me. I believe that you took my sins, that you died on the cross, that you rose again, and you're alive today. I, I receive your life. I receive your forgiveness in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. And we'd be honored to connect with you. There's some information on the screen how we'll send you some material, salvation material, to connect with you, to, so you can know more. And we invite you to come, if you're here in Toronto, to come to 190 Railside Road next week. We'd love to see you there. God bless you. Now over to Pastor Peter. Well, I'm just shouting amen back here, but I'm trying to subdue it so I don't disturb what's going on where Nathan is. A wonderful, great, illuminating message. We're going to take the Lord's table, but first we're going to focus for just a couple of minutes on our financial stewardship. I want to tell you about the greatest, the greatest offering, according to what Jesus is, how he defines an offering in the Bible. It says like this, and I'm reading from Mark 12. And Jesus sat down opposite the treasury. Notice when Jesus went into the meeting place, he sat close to the collection box. That, that's interesting. I don't know if Pastor Nathan does that here, or I, I'm not sure how it works, but I don't think so. And it says, Jesus began observing how the people were putting money into the treasury. And many rich people were putting in large sums. You know, Jesus is very invasive for this. Imagine if Pastor Nathan was following along here when the uh, offering, collecting, receptacles are being passed around and Pastor Nathan would come then he would lean over and he would be looking at, 
at your credit card. He'd be looking at your check or whatever you're doing, taking out of your wallet, and he'd kind of be making a notation if he thought it was good enough. I, I don't think you would like that, but that's what Jesus did. And then it says here that many rich put in large sums, and a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which was about like $2 in our money. And calling his disciples to them, he said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the other contributors to the treasury. For they put in out of their surplus, but she put out of her poverty all she owned, all she had to live on. And this brings the idea. It's not equal amount giving, but it's equal sacrifice. That's the idea. And so today, I want you to notice one. Jesus paid attention to what people gave in the offering. Jesus was focusing on that. You would have thought maybe Jesus should have been in the prayer room leading intercession for the meeting. You may have thought Jesus should have done this or that. He is sitting right by the offering collection box and he's paying attention to how much people are giving. And he says, they gave a lot, they gave a lot. But they said, she gave the most. This story reminds me how important every gift is. Yes, we are grateful at the Toronto Celebration Church for all the people who give large gifts. We need many more of those, to tell you the truth. But I also want to say every gift is so valuable. Don't think that your gift is too small. That's why I encourage people who, young people, they just say, well, mom and dad are giving. You give. Or you say, well, somebody else is doing it. Or I'll wait till I have a different situation. No, do it now because every gift is important and no gift is too small. So in one sense, this gift that this woman gave may seem small, but Jesus says that was the greatest offering of them all. Right now we have an opportunity to be good stewards. Let's all do an offering that says all for Jesus, all for my Lord and Savior, all for the vision he has put in our hearts to, to give the gospel to people. That's one of the main thrusts of the Toronto Celebration Church. I'm gonna pray right now. Father, I thank you. Thank you for this inspiring story. Thank you for what we have heard today about the assembly coming together. And I pray for a tremendous response today in giving, in great generosity, so that Jesus looking on would say, that was a large offering. And whatever that amount it is, regardless of that, let everyone do something large in the name of Jesus. You see on the screen how you can participate? You can text your gift. You can do an e-transfer. You can mail it. You see the church address. You can call it in. And, and maybe the very best is to give online, uh, tizc.ca slash give. For those of you giving internationally or outside of the Toronto area, you may want to do wicconline.org. We'll just show a screen as well for the international giving very quickly. So if people want to give from outside of the Toronto area, you can give in US dollars, euros, etc. PayPal, you see all that. But let's go back to the Toronto screen one more time. Uh, take a note of that. You should have that probably a photograph of that so you can do it at any time. But right now, let's do it today. This is the first day of the week. This is when they did it in the Bible. Let's do it that way. So, uh, so, so go ahead right now and participate. Let's keep our church strong. Let's keep this double for missions in 2021. Let's keep it strong and uh, let's give so that Jesus would say, oh, that, that was wonderful. I want the approval of Jesus and him saying, well done, you good and faithful servant. Thank you for participating right now. I'm gonna be back for the Lord's table, but over to Megan Thurber. Thank you, Pastor Peter. Persecution of Christians remains a big problem for many believers throughout the world today. It comes as a surprise to many Western Christians that today, one in eight Christians are estimated to face persecution. That is more than 340 million Christians who suffer from high levels of persecution and discrimination. Christians face imprisonment, intolerance and abuse. COVID-19 has been another tool to victimize Christians. Access to humanitarian relief is often denied and the persecution is on the rise. 
This is one reason why we Celebration Church have increased our missions giving this year from 10% to 20%. And throughout our partnership with the Stand with Stephen Fund launched by World Impact Ministries this year. First, our support goes to help Christians who are persecuted for their faith. We already support Bible colleges in countries like Myanmar and Indonesia, where persecution in those countries is high. According to Open Doors International, Myanmar is one of the top countries where Christians face persecution. Multiple churches have been attacked in recent weeks with a number of deaths and many more casualties as post-coup violence continues. Myanmar is also currently under constant threat in a bloody military coup which makes gospel work even more challenging. Also, Indonesia regularly sees suicide bombing, including at a church recently during Sunday worship. In both these countries, we support Bible college gospel workers every year. Our Stand with Stephen partnership will affect changes in governments through a strategic partnership with the Global Advocacy Center, which has consultancy status at the United Nations. If a pastor is killed or a church is bombed, government leaders are rallied to create pressure on regimes that tolerate persecution against Christians. The work engages in the defense of human rights and Christian public engagement. Some of the work is by necessity secret, especially in countries where the gospel is forbidden. These are beautiful stories. There are beautiful stories of pastors who were in prison but have been released because of this work before the UN Human Rights Council. It is for this reason we Celebration Church have doubled our missions giving in 2021. It is a partnership with the one in eight Christians who suffer today for their faith in Christ. Thank you Celebration Church for making this possible through your generous giving, love and prayers. Finally, while we continue to reach the globe, we continue to reach our own city through the pandemic. Food insecurity is a rising problem, which is why we have prioritized food distribution to local food banks and sh shelters. Here is Paul Cabina delivering a weekly food shipment to Flemington Food Bank. And here is Gideon Berter, our outreach pastor, in his own words, talking about our weekly food shipment to Scott Mitchin. Hello, DIC's family. On behalf of the volunteers of the Outreach Ministry, I want to thank you for your support, help, and your generous giving that made it possible for us to provide 24,000 LBs of food to the shelter homes despite the pandemic. Without your generous giving, it wouldn't have been possible. Not only we were able to provide food to the homeless, but we also had the privilege of praying with the staff and the volunteers of the shelter home. I pray that the Lord bless you abundantly and your family this new year 2021 for helping in God's kingdom. God bless you. Celebration Church family for making this possible through your generous giving, love, and prayers. Now let's go to this week's video announcements. Hello Celebration Church. Here are the three things you need to know this Sunday. Good news! Ontario has moved to stage one of our reopening plan, which allows for indoor worship again. In fact, we are meeting indoors today at 190 Railside Road, and we invite you next Sunday, June 20th at 10.30 a.m. and 1 p.m. for indoor worship here at 190 Railside Road. Also, as it is Father's Day, we will celebrate all the men with a free gift. Thank you to everyone who made last Sunday, June 6th, a great success at the drive-in rally. You can see some pictures scrolling across the screen as I speak of preaching and worship and enjoying the presence of God and each other. And finally, with the reopening here in Ontario, indoors youth and young adults worship services resume every Friday at 7.30 p.m. here at 190 Railside Road. All youth and young adults are invited to this awesome experience every Friday. All right, well, it's back to me. Sorry you caught me a little bit unaware for a moment, but I was meditating on the Lord's table and uh, I was listening to Elizabeth giving those announcements. I'm so glad that we are in person. And so if you're watching this online next Sunday, we are here in person. I have the communion elements right here. I'll hold them up so you can see them on the camera. Maybe you have a cup. 
and a piece of bread at home. Stretch your hand over it. In the name of Jesus, we now declare that this bread and this cup is sanctified to the Lord's table. In the name of Jesus, amen. When Jesus took the bread, he said, this is my body given for you. You know, when it comes to the Lord's table, people have had great difficulty to put it into words. Now, some have said that there's a literal transformation that occurs from bread to the physical body of Jesus. I don't think the disciples understood it that way when he said, when he said, take bread and cup. But on, on, on the other extreme, we say, oh, this is just a symbol. It's not so much, just a symbol. No, Jesus says, this is my body. And when he took the cup, he said, this cup is the new covenant. Not just that it's symbolic of it. So there's something powerful in the communion. It, it, it's, it's more than a symbol. And that's why I like to pray over it and declare that this bread and cup is sanctified uh, to the Lord's table. So I believe God's covenant is coming to you today. Covenant of life and health and eternal life and peace and everything you need. It's coming to you through this communion. So in the name of Jesus, would you partake of the bread right now? Give thanks to the Lord. His body means health and life for your body. And then we take the cup. This cup is the, is the new covenant. It, it, it's God touching you and whatever the new covenant has available is available to you through the communion. So in the name of Jesus, we partake of the cup. Now, when I speak the name of Jesus, this is not just some kind of prayer. We are ministering Jesus to you. So I reach out my hands and I say, in the name of Jesus, take everything that's yours. Take what God has provided. And then say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. And then take a moment and just to keep praising and thanking him. I want to hear how God has touched you. Make sure when we see you in person or whether you send a message, depending on where you're watching, send us a message. Let us know what God has done for you. You know, we have so many beautiful stories of people who've been healed in our church here in Toronto without anybody praying for them, just taking the Lord's table. They were healed right there. Seems so undramatic, so simple, but that's how simple it is. So let us know what God has done for you and we rejoice together. And now I want to pass it back to Pastor Nathan. And I echo that. We want to hear from you, so let us know what God is doing in your life. While we're coming to the end of today's service, it's been great to have you with us, and we invite you back next Sunday. In fact, if you live here in Toronto, I'll say it one more time, we would love to see you in person here at 190 Railside Road. We'll have two services, 1030 and 1 o'clock. Uh, we'll follow all the, all the regulations that we've been told to do, so we'll keep it, you know, masks and distancing and such. And so we're allowed, we're allowed to open now at 15% capacity. If people, you know, maybe you say, well, what happens if everybody comes back? Well, then we just have multiple, even more services. So let's make that a problem we need to, we need to address. And so that would be a very good problem. So we would so dearly love you. And of course, we recognize we have our worldwide family joining us. So we invite you to come back out. We'll keep streaming every Sunday. So we look forward to see you. We love you. We pray for you. God bless. And by the way, let me say this as well. Sorry. Uh, our team was just about to cut it off there. Uh, because we're resuming in-person services, our encounter rooms, which were commenced when, when we, which we do after the service in Zoom rooms, when we're not having in-person services, of course, now that we're back to in-person, we will not be having our Zoom rooms or encounter rooms at the end of this service today. So we love you. We pray for you. And we hope to see you next Sunday. God bless.